All right, all right, guys. Welcome back to the uh, Dragosh Energy podcast. It has been a minute. It has been a minute since I've done this podcast. And as you can see, I'm starting it afresh. I'm starting a new vibe of this podcast with my hair, with my hair rolled out. I'm doing it on the road. At the moment, I'm in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And I am here to do a show tonight and one tomorrow. This is the 5th of June, if you're wondering what time I'm recording this. And I wanted to basically just give you guys a quick update on what's been happening. I'm going to try to be doing more of these. I know I have been saying this for a long time, but I will be trying to do more of these going forward. And the reason for this is because summer is coming and I think it's time to focus a little bit more on this. I've done uh, shows in the past couple of months. I've been going around Europe. I've done a lot of things. In this particular podcast, I want to give you guys a quick update on free topics. Free topics. One of them is me going to Romania to do some shows with Ari Shafir, the American comedian, if I'm not familiar. And uh, me going to Cannes for my uh, girlfriend's movie premiere. That was quite fun as well. And the third one, a couple of things that I've been doing recently, but I'll be focusing on The Legend of Zelda. I have been playing that. So let's start off uh, in the reverse way. Leave the Ari Shafir stuff for the last. Um, for the past couple of months, basically, as some of you guys might know, I have been doing a little bit of a therapy. Therapy. Just to kind of see what's cooking in the head uh, and how to kind of improve life going forward and one of the things that came out of therapy was the fact that I would need to focus a little bit more on activities that would take me away from what you would consider what I would consider as work right because I do a lot of um, I do a lot of trabajo in the forms of writing in terms of uh, you know setting up shows in the forms of editing and one of the biggest problems it seems that I have is not being able to turn off you know when do you turn off when do you kind of recharge and focus a little bit more on uh, activities that are away from work, you know, just not to be a non-stop working machine, right? Which has kind of been the case for the past couple of years. I've been very focused on succeeding, yes, su succeeding, yes, locks, flowing locks. I'm just kind of getting stuff out there, right, because it's so difficult to, I mean, I think from, um, from the start, I kind of put into my mind that I have to work even more harder and I have to work harder, I have to work smarter, because, you know, English stand-up comedy in Europe is relatively very small industry, and most of the people don't necessarily have a way to get the content, this was at the start, so I need to work extra hard to compensate and to be extra smart about how I work in order to make up for um, a geographical uh, disadvantage, if you will, yes, you know, if you, um, and there is a somewhat, there is a somewhat of a de geographical disadvantage if you look at Facebook, if you look at Reels, uh, if you look at TikTok, because, you know, a lot of times the way that the algorithm works is it shows your clip to 10 people, if five out of those 10 people engage with more than 50% of the content, then it shows it to like 100 people, same rule, 50 out of those 100 people engage with it, shows it to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, so on and so forth. That's how kind of the algorithm works from what I understand. But of course, the big difference in my case is that because I'm in Europe, not everybody speaks English. So five out of those 10 people might actually not speak English when they see the content. So they don't engage, which restricts the reach. So I thought I have to work even harder to get that reach and to get, um, get through, get through, make it through the noise so that people can, that people can hear, you know? Um, so basically with this kind of like always work on mentality, I've had found it hard a little bit to de-stress. So you have like elements of stress building up. And sometimes they might pop up in different ways in different parts of la vida, such as uh, constant work. So uh, as I was talking to my therapist, one of the ideas was to find a way to relax. And um, I remembered I had a Nintendo Switch. And at the time, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom was coming out. So what I've done for the past couple of months is I have... Uh, gotten this game and I've been playing it on the airplanes, on the trains, and at other points where I have a little bit of time, right? I also bought a PlayStation where I'm playing Jedi, uh, what's the new Jedi Knight? Uh, the new the new Star Wars game. I haven't played that much because I'm still on Zelda at the moment. But I've kind of tried to find uh, elements of focus to, to get some of the stress off my back. My back has been with the stress, you know. Um, so far, so good. It's going in the good direction. And I'm quite satisfied with this Legend of Zelda game. I don't have any link to where you can buy it or anything, but so far, I have, I'm very impressed with the level of creativity that has gone into this game. Just the flexibility. If you've never played any of these games, I'll keep it short, but it allows you... It, they've really figured out the secret to creativity, and that is combining two different things and making something new, right? So you have the ability to combine, basically there's this, this uh, ultra hand slash fuse ability that allows you to stick two items together and use them. So for example, you can stick a rock to a sword and use it as a rock sword. Brilliant! 
You can stick a log to a sword and use it as a log sword. You can stick them to a shield. You can make stuff together. You can make constructs. You can make machines. And there's a lot of fun clips on what people are doing it, uh, doing with it online. So I've been using that as an avenue for relaxing a little bit in the past couple of months. And I found it, uh, yeah, I find it works. Uh, the, other, uh, the other angle of it, it uh, tends to absorb you quite a lot. So you don't really get the chance to do as many things as you would before. But I think it was a good way to kind of detach from the general amounts of stress. Um, so that's one thing that has been happening. That's topic number one. I hope that was informing. If you have not played Legend of Zelda, I think it is quite... Uh, it's like, apparently, it's like almost like two to three hundred hours of gameplay. So it's a lot. You're going to sink a lot of time into that bad boy. But I, it has been fun so far. And I've been quite impressed what they've managed to do with the fact that the, the actual Nintendo Switch is basically an old tablet from 2017, like five-year-old tablet. Great stuff. Like, I think you know, from an engineer perspective, they are... Amazing at what they're doing. Good job, guys. Development team in Japan. They really know how to make stuff. Um, yeah, so I've kind of focused my time on that. Let's go to number two. I went to Cannes with my girlfriend, which was very interesting. My girlfriend had a short premiere there. So I also tagged along to see what's happening and also, of course, to be very supportive. And it was interesting to see because it's a completely different world. Completely different world. It's a different world. I mean, as opposed to like the stand-up comedy world where I'm currently engaged in 24-7 or maybe 22 out of 7 nowadays because, woo! Uh, it was very interesting to see that, you know, the movie production is a big it's a big endeavor. You know, there's a lot of people that get involved. There's a lot of moving parts. You've got producers. You've got directors. You've got directors of photographies. You've got cinematographers. You've got costumes. You've got set design. Very big, very big production. So it was interesting to go and check it out. Uh, one of the things uh, about Cannes, I was expecting it to be a lot more expensive, but it was uh, relatively almost London prices. Maybe they did not inflate the prices as much as they could have in that period of time. But yeah, it was fun to see a lot of... It's, uh, it looks very looks very nice. It's like the French Riviera. It's a lot of palm trees. There's yachts everywhere. Um, people... The thing is, people with, with badges, that's, that's the thing you'll see if you go there. Because I didn't have a badge because you can only get a badge if you're part of a production. So I was not part of a production and I wasn't able to get a badge, an accreditation as they call it. So I wasn't really able to um, participate in a lot of the events. I was able to watch some publicly available movies. There are a couple of programs that allow you to watch movies that are, are being screened there. So I've watched a couple of movies there. I will get to that in a second. But it was interesting to see how uh, it's basically work. Yeah, it's work. It's a lot of work for the people in the industry. They have to go there. They have to mingle. They have to talk to people. They have to make connections, valuable connections that might make or break your next project. So I thought that was very, very interesting to see uh, because from my perspective, I didn't really go there looking for anything or looking for any connection or looking for any you know links, anything of the sorts. Uh, but a lot of people that were there, they were trying to network. They're trying to meet people. So it's quite, quite interesting to see the dynamics of this uh, industry that still has a lot of gatekeepers. Whereas the stand-up comedy industry, the way that I do it, you know, and other comedians in Europe are doing it, where we set up our own venues, set up our own shows, sell our own tickets, doesn't have that much, uh, that that many gatekeepers in, in that regard. If you find a venue and you can sell tickets, you go there and you do it. Woo! Whereas with stand up with uh, the movies, you need to get a producer, you need to get the project online, you need to put in a lot of work. It's like two to three years of work before you even see the project live. You know, it's like a, it's a big. It's a big thing, right? So I was interested to see how that was uh, was looking, and I I, I kind of um, drew a couple of parallels, 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 a couple of contrasts between this world and that world. And uh, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a big team worker. I'm not a big team guy. I mean, I've I've done a lot of stuff in team before, but I I don't know. I, I get a bit frustrated that people I tend to move a bit faster than other people, so that you know sometimes I get a little bit frustrated that they're slowing me down when I'm in a theme team context, right? Uh, maybe it's also my, if you look back at my own, uh, I don't know, educational endeavors, if you will, educational endeavors, you know, like I did law and then I did headhunting for a while. That's, these are all kind of like individualistic type of um, uh, endeavors, endeavors, professions. So maybe that's why it makes a lot more sense for me to stand up comedy and not something where it's a lot of moving parts, right? Uh, even though in this context of stand-up comedy, yeah, there is a little degree of coordination that I do with people that help me on terms of setting up shows, editing, and so on and so forth, right? But it was interesting. The movies, let's talk about the movies. I think, I, from my perspective, I think that a lot of the movies that I saw in the Festival du Con, uh, they are very risk-taking. I think the, the directors or the writers, they took a lot of risks when making the movies. I would not particularly see them as being easy box office successes. I think that's a completely different area. 
but because they take a bit of degree of risk, they take some uh, degree of liberties in how they express how they express themselves. It kind of helps push the industry in a particular direction. I think that's what I've watched a couple of uh, compilation of shorts. I think this is what they're trying to reward at Khan, like risk taking and pushing the industry in areas where it hasn't been pushed uh, previously. So I think if you were to, to kind of like uh, compare it with something, you could compare it with the notion of a PhD. A PhD, the, po the point of a PhD is, as it was explained to me at some point, is this circle here is the circle of knowledge you have in one particular domain. The PhD's point is to push a little finger up and stop it from being a circle because that expands the overall um, totality of knowledge we have in that domain. So I think this is kind of like the idea with the with the Khan Festival and the awards and how they kind of choose movies to participate. The idea is you want to push the industry further a little bit. They want stuff that is a little bit more experimental. They want stuff that is a little bit more... Um, I guess, a brave. This is the lingua that they use. Brave. They want stuff that is a little bit brave. So interesting. I, I thought it was interesting to see that direction and that particular way of looking at things. I had fun. Uh, I took some, uh, some, some great... Uh, souvenirs. I got some great souvenirs there. We took some great photos, and I think my uh, my girlfriend really enjoyed it. She described it as being Disneyland for her. So I think I'm very happy that she had a great experience, and I hope you guys will be able to get the chance to see her uh, her small short film that was premiered there. Hopefully, in a context um, uh, online or in a live cinema. So it's pretty cool. I, I really like the short. I think that she did a great job. Um, all right, that's with the can situation. I hope that uh, gives you some uh, info on the subject. All right, and with regards to the Ari Shafir shows, if you guys do not know, Ari Shafir is an American comedian basically uh, based out of the U.S. He did a couple of shows around Europe in the past couple of months, and I had the opportunity to go and open for him in two cities in Romania, Cluj and Bucharest, and it was a very good experience. We had a very good chat. We, uh, uh, Unlike some other opportunities, like, for example, back in 2019, uh, I had the chance to open for Jim Gaffigan at the time. I think it was more of a kind of like uh, arm's length distance in terms of interaction because I think he preferred to be a little bit more by himself. But in this context, both myself and the producer of the shows in Romania, we had the chance to hang out with Ari quite a lot. And he's a very kind guy, very, very supportive, uh, very helpful if you have any questions and, and very eager to share it from his experience. I mean, you can tell that someone has gone through the grind of uh, comedy. Uh, especially in the context where you basically you have to do shows, different kinds of shows, the qualities are different. Sometimes the tickets are going up, sometimes the tickets are going down. So he's quite um, he's quite battle tested, you know, battle tested in the in the world of comedy. So it's very interesting to have some chats and understand exactly how he does shows. The show that he did in uh, Cluj and Bucharest, they were very good shows. Uh, the laughter was insane. I've never heard laughter so aggressive. I mean, the rooms were also quite big, much bigger, they were bigger size rooms. Uh, uh, beyond the 500 mark so they were quite quite um, people were really appreciating the comedy and I thought that the style of comedy is indeed more New York he is based out of New York so New York style comedy tends to be more heavy on the punchlines and maybe less on the storytelling it's more like bits placed together in a bigger hour with with uh, uh, I mean in, in his context he has a narrative to the show because he's done the Edinburgh Fringe so that kind of uh, inspires the hour but a lot of times if you look at comedians like Mark Norman Sarah Murrell there's no really a narrative throughout the full, uh, throughout the entire show. It's just kind of like packed with bits to make the audience laugh as much as possible, which sometimes works. But I found from my experience that in uh, Europe, where the English is the second language, sometimes uh, bombarding people with jokes can get a bit exhausting. So they do prefer a little bit of a narrative. So I've tried to I've tried to kind of like uh, you know walk a line between that and also the the prevalence of jokes throughout the hour. Yes. So we had a good experience. I was very um, I was very um, happy to have had the chance to kind of share some info, learn a bit more about the infrastructure and the circuit, the circuit network in the US, and also be able to draw some comparisons, comparisons between... Oh, I'm a bird. I am delicate. Uh, between my experience with the... Um, with the system here and his experience from the system there so it's interesting to compare and i think uh yeah he was very very happy to be in romania he is of romanian descent if you know it or not uh the issue was the fact that uh his his, his dad was born in romania but because you know world war ii a lot of the documents were burned so he's now trying to regain 
the Romanian citizenship for him. Citizenship. Cis- uh, that's how I say it. Citizenship. Um, but it seems to be a bit of a, a bit of a chaotic uh, process because bureaucracy in Romania is loco, a bit crazy. At the same time, uh, you know, I think they, from what I understood, they, they're asking him to go look into the records, the archives, and these archives would require them to be intact from like over 70 years ago. So I don't know if these archives are actually accurate to, to prove that he was born in Romania or not. So I'm not sure if that's going to work out for him, but I hope that it does. Um, Romania did enjoy having Arisha Fio there, and I think uh, they're more than happy to receive him back with warm embraces. Warm embraces, yes. Volver a Romania. Come to Romania. Returning to Romania. Uh, I think I've managed to kick, kick in kick, 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 kick in the free topics I was talking about. Uh, other areas with the shows that I'm doing at the moment, um, it's interesting. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit of the plan for the summer. The plan for the summer would be to kind of focus a little bit more on the Patreon. I'm going to start the Patreon. I'm going to do some podcasts there. I've got some other ideas for other type of podcasts that I'm going to be doing. And at the same time, I've been doing a series of shows in Berlin. I'm going to be doing a series of shows in Berlin that I will be putting on Patreon exclusively. And obviously, there's the opportunity to attend them live in Berlin. So these are the hot gossip shows, which are very, very fun shows where people get to write down gossips on a piece of paper and I get to riff off them. I will be doing a show about the Dragos versus reggaeton, a, liter- a literary interpretation of reggaeton music as understood by Moa Dragos. I'm going to be doing a new hour material uh, show very, very soon in Berlin. And I'm also going to be doing a show where we focus on uh, the art of cursing. Yes, if you are from any part of the world, you will know that cursing is an integral an integral part of every culture. And we are going to explore how these curses, curses develop, how they kind of like, uh, you know, shape up, and what is the result of all these curses on someone's morale and uh, mentality, and what does it say about the people. So I hope we're going to have a lot of this. I think there's a lot of uh, Balkan material in this direction to kind of, uh, you know, fill up an hour or so. So hopefully we're going to be doing this as audience interaction shows, but I also plan on bringing the Spanish podcast and the Romanian podcast into the fray into the fray very soon so uh let's see how things are kind of shaping up but it will be a full summer because i'll also be doing a lot of writing this summer so hopefully i will be able to get a new hour ready in the next three months i hope this is the goal but uh yeah look at that we have finally gotten to the point where we're returning with the podcast i've got a mic at the moment it's connected to my camera uh and hopefully we're going to be seeing more of this podcast going forward in the future and uh yeah hopefully we'll all be able to enjoy and I'll be doing some Q&As. And uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any requests on a location where you'd like me to come. I'm trying to come to more places this summer, but I'm also trying to balance it out. Uh, I guess one of the other things that's coming out of therapy is uh, it's important to find our own definition of success, yes? And what is it? How- I don't know why I'm becoming British because my therapist is Polish. But the idea would be to define success in the way that works best for you. So I think the best way that it works for me is having a good quality of life, right? Finding a balance, not overworking, you know, and also being able to kind of leave space for, uh, yeah, creativity, empathy. <laughs> so many words, Ragosh. And generally having fun. It's important to have fun, right? So hopefully we can have fun, you know, and have a good life. That's it. Is this, is, is this a TED Talk? Maybe. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will be doing more podcasts with my hair out if you enjoyed it. So let me know what you think. And uh, subscribe if you're watching this on uh, YouTube. If you're watching it, check it out on Spotify. Uh, Leave five stars. Leave a comment. And uh, yeah, see you guys soon. Bye-bye.